your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching.
Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Should we start? Hello, everyone. Welcome. 
Welcome to our forum on international security and just transition. I'm Deborah Javelin. I'm an associate professor of political science here at Notre Dame. I'm also affiliated with the Environmental Change Initiative, the Kellogg Institute, the Kroc Institute, and the Nanovic Institute. Thank you all for coming. Um, please note that masks are required in Hesburgh Library. Um, this is a reminder to please keep masks on and wear them properly throughout the forum. Climate change, sustainability, and international security are inextricably linked. Environmental and climate-related disasters threaten food and water security, drive conflict, and destabilize international security. Global conflict, in turn, threatens international action on climate change while also endangering the environment. A just transition to a more sustainable future must confront the threats that arise from cascading long-term climate disruptions. In his 2015 encyclical, Laudato Si, Pope Francis challenges fundamental assumptions of the global economy while also calling for renewed international cooperation to care for our common home. The Pope's deep critique of conventional statecraft offers Notre Dame an opportunity to examine environmental threats and collaborative opportunities from a missional perspective. We are lucky to be here today for a presentation from Joseph M. Bryan, Senior Advisor on Climate to the Secretary of Defense, and a discussion and audience question and answer with our panelists, Mary Ellen O'Connell, Eugene Galtz, and Roy Scranton, who will also be serving as our moderator. This event is made possible thanks to Notre Dame Research, with support from the Notre Dame Environmental Humanities Initiative, the Notre Dame International Security Center, the Notre Dame Institute for Advanced Studies, and the Notre Dame Environmental Change Initiative. We also need to thank Bruce Huber in the law school for his unflagging work to bring all of this about, and Carolyn Sherman, Kara Primer, and Susan Tuscan for their work behind the scenes without which none of this would have happened. Also, there will be a reception immediately following for continued discussion with the panelists. Because of COVID restrictions and, uh, in, and university protocols about indoor gatherings with food, the reception is limited to only university community members, faculty, staff, and students. Um, we're sorry that others um, can't join us. The reception will be in the scholars' lounge across the hall. So I will now introduce our, our, um, our panelist. Joe Bryan was formally appointed as special assistant to the Secretary of Defense and was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Energy during the Obama administration starting in 2014, coming from the US Senate where he was a military issues staffer. More recently, Mr. Bryan was the investigations team lead for the Committee on Armed Services. During his tenure, the committee completed investigations into cyber intrusions, US cost and allied contributions to support the US military presence overseas, counterfeit electronic parts in the military supply chain, private security contractors in Afghanistan, and the treatment of detainees in US custody. Before that, Mr. Bryan served on the Select Committee on Intelligence, represented Senator Carl Levin, and was responsible for legislative issues related to the Senate Judiciary and the Governmental Affairs Committee. Joseph Bryan started his career in energy and mining policy with jobs in South Africa and Namibia after earning a master's degree in energy and environmental policy from the University of Delaware. After leaving the Obama administration, Brian joined the Atlantic Council as a senior fellow and founded Muswell Orange LLC, a one-man clean energy consultancy. We also have with us uh, uh, Eugene Goltz, an associate professor of political science at Notre Dame. Uh, Eugene Goltz works primarily at the intersection of national security and economic policy on subjects including innovation, defense management, and U.S. grand strategy. He co-wrote a well-known international security article that coined the term restraint as a proposed grand strategy for the United States. He is a vi visiting fellow at Defense Priorities for calendar year 2021. From 2010 to 2012, he served in the Pentagon as senior advisor to the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Manufacturing and Industrial Base Policy. He's the co-author of two books, Buying Military Transformation, Technological Innovation and the Defense Industry, and U.S. Defense Politics, The Origins of Security Policy. He is a chair of the International Security Section of the International Studies Association and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He previously held faculty positions at the, at the University of Texas at Austin, Williams College, the University of Kentucky, and George Mason University, and his PhD is from MIT. We also have Mary Ellen O'Connell. Um, she is the Robert and Marion Short Professor of Law and Research Professor of International Dispute Resolution at the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies. 
Um, her work is in the areas of international law on the use of force, international dispute resolution, and international legal theory. She's the author or editor of numerous books, including most recently, The Art of Law in the International Community, uh, and Self-Defense Against Non-State Actors, uh, both published by Cambridge University Press. And our organizer today and uh, commentator and also moderator is Roy Scranton, an associate professor of English at the University of Notre Dame and the director of the Notre Dame Environmental Humanities Initiative. He's the author of five books, including Learning to Die in the Anthropocene, Reflections on the End of a Civilization, the monograph Total Mobilization, World War II and, the, and American Literature, and the novel War Porn. Scranton's essays, articles, and reviews have been published in the New York Times, The Nation, MIT Technology Review, The Baffler, The New Republic, and elsewhere. He won the Teresa A. White Literary Award for short fiction, was the recipient of a Mrs. Giles G. Whiting Fellowship in the Humanities, and was a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Energy and Environmental Research in Human Sciences at Rice University, and was awarded a Lannan Literary Fellowship in Fiction. He is currently a, a fellow at the Notre Dame Institute for Advanced Studies. I thank everybody for, for joining us and, and for our, our panelists for their comments in advance. And with that, I give you Joseph Bryan. In my entire family, my parents and we five kids vacationed at Notre Dame and stayed in Lewis Hall. I know my mom was probably thrilled with that choice, which I'm quite certain was not hers. We were religious about fighting Irish football, but we always understood that Notre Dame was more than about football. Notre Dame stood for values. And this discussion and Notre Dame's leadership on the just transition to a sustainable future reflects those values. You know, I read a quote from Father Jenkins that the question is not whether to transition to a cleaner, more sustainable future, but how and how quickly. Under President Biden and Secretary Austin's leadership, the Department of Defense is working hard on the how. As to the how quickly, that answer could not be more clear. As the world confronts drought and unrelenting heat, more powerful hurricanes and typhoons, raging wildfires and devastating floods, the answer is right in front of us as quickly as possible. Now, some have asked why the Secretary of Defense needs a climate advisor. What does climate change have to do with national security? Well, my answer is the same as Secretary Austin's. There is little about what the department does to defend the American people that is not affected by climate change. The evidence of that? Well, as one observer recently put it, you don't have to have a PhD. You don't need to be a climate scientist. You just need to be a person who looks out the window. That's the truth. And the implications of climate change, what we are seeing out our windows, for national security are both clear and present. Just last week, the California Army National Guard activated hundreds to fight the Carter Fire and prevent its spread to South Lake Tahoe. And that guard activation was only the latest on the West Coast. Hundreds of Guard and Reserve members were called on to respond to the bootleg fire in Oregon and the Dixie Fire in California earlier this summer. And there is undoubtedly, but unfortunately, more likely to come. General Dan Hokanson, the Chief of the National Guard Bureau, described the challenge facing the Guard when it comes to wildfires. We used to talk about fire season, he said, but now it's really a fire year. And it's not just wildfires. Thousands of Guard personnel from 11 states helped respond to Hurricane Ida in Louisiana last week, bringing with them aircraft and boats and high water vehicles, generators and engineers. The Guard helped provide security for communities and opened food distribution centers to support people in need. We also saw the Guard activated in the Northeast as Ida devastated communities there as well. The implications of climate change for the Department of Defense and the military extend well beyond reacting to recent events on the ground. Look, the Arctic is warming at a rate twice as fast as the rest of the planet, altering the strategic environment. Already the region is seeing competition heat up with China and Russia over sea routes and mineral wealth. 
Secretary Austin visited Alaska in July, warning that climate could make the Arctic, quote, a theater for resource competition and even instability. At the same time, hotter temperatures and drought are devastating communities around the world, inducing mass migration, contributing to instability, and posing challenges for local governments. This spring, a panel of defense ministers from around the world assembled to discuss the challenge that climate change poses. They discussed how families faced with the loss of their communities and their livelihoods risk their lives in search of safety and security. But as Secretary Austin has noted, mass migration can leave them vulnerable to exploitation and radicalization, conditions that can undermine stability and threaten our own national security. The Iraqi Minister of Defense recently talked about how, in his country, drought conditions contribute to unrest. Put simply, he said, Iraq is very hot, and it's getting hotter. He said the climate crisis, quote, undermines our stability and poses an existential threat to national security. In a country where 60% of the population is below the age of 25, he said, climate-induced challenges are a recipe for unrest and dissatisfaction with the government that sometimes drives individuals into the arms of malign actors. He talked about how ISIS understands that vulnerability and has targeted water resources, including the Mosul Dam, in an effort to undermine the government. Across Africa, climate change threatens food insecurity, disease, and displacement. Some regions are likely to get drier and hotter. Others may get wetter. The United Nations has said that roughly 80% of the Sahel's farmland is degraded, and about 50 million people depend on livestock rearing for survival. That's 50 million people at risk from climate change. In 2020, flooding in Sudan submerged farmland the size of Djibouti, displacing 500,000 people. In Central America, drought in Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala is a contributing factor to migration north. A recent study from Duke University found that lower rainfall totals are associated with greater numbers of Honduran families apprehended at the U.S. southern border. And in the far reaches of the Pacific, rising sea levels and more frequent and intense storms put individuals, families, and whole communities at risk while pushing the limits of our collective capacity to respond. For example, typhoons in Guam most commonly occur from June to December. But in February 2019, Typhoon Wutip forced our military to pause humanitarian exercises with our Australian and Japanese partners. The impacts of climate change on vulnerable people and fragile states are a fact, and the implications of that for security and stability cannot be ignored. For the Department of Defense, climate change is a mission generator, demanding attention and resources. Look. We rely on the military in times of crisis, whether that crisis is the result of conflict, demanding intervention, or a natural disaster requiring humanitarian relief. But the fact is that the same phenomena that drive those mission demands also challenge our capacity to respond. We are forced to sortie ships in the face of hurricanes. We can't train when it gets too hot. We evacuate installations in the face of wildfires. Just look at what's happening out west right now. There have been evacuations at Beale Air Force Base and Camp Pendleton Marine Corps Base in just the last couple of months, and the challenge is growing. Conditions in the Gulf led to Hurricane Ida strengthening at a rate twice as fast as what is normally defined as rapid intensification. At 11 p.m. on Saturday, Ida had winds of 105 miles an hour. Just 12 hours later, that had increased to 150 miles an hour. While many bases on the Gulf Coast avoided a direct hit, nearby installations like Naval Air Station Pensacola are still contending with hundreds of millions of dollars in damage from Hurricane Sally just last fall. The truth is that we pay more every year to rebuild military installations damaged by climate change. $5 billion at Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida, $3 billion at Camp Lejeune in North Carolina, and $400 million at Nebraska's Offutt Air Force Base. Climate change is going to cost us in readiness and resources. The reality is that it already has. We need to make sure that we are prepared for those impacts, 
always with a focus on the mission. But as the Secretary has said many times, our mission objectives are actually well aligned with our climate goals. There is not, I repeat, there is not a competition between what's good for the climate and what's good for the military's mission. The department's forthcoming climate adaptation plan reflects that alignment, stating the clear objective to, quote, ensure the DOD can operate under changing climate conditions, preserving operational capability, and enhancing the natural and man-made systems essential to the department's success. And the transition to a sustainable energy future is actually good for the mission. For example, our military bases house critical missions that need to stay up and running even if the electric grid goes down. And we have a threat environment, not just from climate change, but also cyber. Think about the colonial pipeline attack just a couple months ago that put the grid at risk. Well, one of the best ways to improve energy resilience is to use less energy in the first place, to invest in becoming more energy efficient. You can also strengthen resilience by taking advantage of clean energy technologies, like energy storage and distributed generation like solar panels. A great example of that is at Marine Corps Air Station Miramar outside San Diego. Over the past several years, Miramar has built a microgrid capable of powering critical missions even when the grid goes down. To get there, they leverage a range of assets from landfill gas to solar. And last summer during a heat wave, Miramar actually took six megawatts of power off the grid for several hours to help the local utility deal with exceptionally high demand and prevent rolling blackouts, preserving the grid for everyone. As the world grapples with how to deal with the challenge of climate change, the solutions we pioneer at the department can help chart a path to more resilient communities. But we can't do it alone. As Secretary Austin has said, a shared global commitment on climate can help us create a safer, more resilient, secure, and sustainable future for everyone. Amidst the ever more present challenges of climate change, there are bright spots. The International Energy Agency issued its Renewable Energy Market Update for 2021 a few months ago. Renewables were the only energy source for which demand increased during the pandemic. When it comes to the electric grid, IEA predicts that renewables will account for 90% of new power capacity additions globally over the next two years. And that's not just because renewables are clean, it's because they are competitive. In the auto sector, the global market is going electric. Volvo will be all electric by 2030, GM by 2035, Ford in Europe by 2030, and Volkswagen will bring 70 new electric models to market by the end of the decade, and 50% of the cars they sell in US and Chinese markets will be electric by 2030. The world is changing, and the climate and clean energy challenge and opportunity raise issues we need to engage. And for the Department of Defense, it's clear that we need to take on this challenge, not simply because it matters to the climate, but because it matters to the mission. Secretary Austin has put it this way, quote, we face all kinds of threats in our line of work, he said, but few of them deserve to be called existential and the climate crisis does. Climate change is making the world more unsafe and we need to act. Act to change to meet this moment. I began my talk with a quote from one Notre Dame president and I'll close with another. Universities, the font of most human knowledge and knowledgeable people, Father Ted Hesburgh once said, will be at the heart of generating the people who, in turn, will generate the change. It will take a very special kind of university to direct change in such a way that humans do not destroy themselves and their world. It is this kind of institution, he said, that Notre Dame aspires to be. Thank you for the opportunity to join you this afternoon, for leading this discussion on the transition to a sustainable future, and for being the institution of Father Hesburgh's aspirations. Thank you.
and knowledgeable people, Father Ted Hesburgh once said, will be at the heart of generating the people who, in turn, will generate the change. It will take a very special kind of university to direct change in such a way that humans do not destroy themselves and their world. It is this kind of institution, he said, that Notre Dame aspires to be. Thank you for the opportunity to join you this afternoon, for leading this discussion on the transition to a sustainable future, and for being the institution of Father Hesburgh's aspirations. Thank you. Tell me where. Whichever, <laughs> wherever, wherever you feel. <laughs> all right. And then halfway through, we'll shift to the other Yeah. Um, all right. Well, uh, thank you all for coming, uh, and, and thank you, Deborah, for the, for the introductions, and thank you, Joe, uh, out there watching, um, for being here with us in spirit. Um, I want to thank uh, Mary O'Connell for, for joining us uh, at the last minute. We had a swap out, and I really appreciate that. Why don't I go last, since I am a last minute addition. Very and, uh, you know, I'll see if there's something I can add to the people who actually prepare for <laughs> But you know, I'm, I'm a law professor, so the topic will probably, probably happen, and I don't have too much to say, but let's see. OK. Well, shall I? Do you, do you want to go, Eugene? Shall, OK. Um, very well, then. So uh, I prepared uh, some, some brief remarks. Um, one of the challenges of, of history uh, is that any particular moment we might uh, take as the beginning of the story, at the same time, the development and complication of a previous thread. Uh, I thought I'd like to begin my remarks by talking about my time as a soldier in Iraq. I thought it's personal, it's narrative, it's exciting. Um, but I didn't feel like that would make sense to talk about my personal experience without also talking about the uh, unlawful US invasion of that sovereign country and how it was justified by a web of lies um, by the Vice President Cheney, uh, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, Secretary of State Colin Powell, and others in the Bush, Bush administration. That war and subsequent op occupation eventually cost US, US taxpayers between two and three trillion dollars killed uh, at least around 200,000 and maybe as many as half a million Iraqis um, and profoundly destabilized the region, including sort of seeding the ground for an incubating, if you will, ISIS, uh, which emerged a few years later as a major force, uh, a new war, uh, more deaths. Uh, and of course, you can't understand the war in Iraq, right, without talking about the American war in Afghanistan, uh, which has just come, in the words of the New York Times' David Zucchino, to a tragic and chaotic end. After two decades of failure and corruption, more than 200,000 dead and another $2 trillion wasted. And then you can't understand uh, Iraq and Afghanistan without understanding decades of American intervention in the Middle East and Southwest Asia, including the more than $600 million funneled through the CIA to uh, Afghan insurgents uh, during the Soviet occupation there um, that indirectly helped foster Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, US support for Saddam Hussein during the Iran-Iraq war, uh, overthrow of the democratically elected Iranian government in 1963, uh, which all comes down in the end uh, to the importance of oil in American post-war hegemony. All this is to say, I, I hope Joe Bryan might forgive me if I'm skeptical, even pessimistic, about not only the good intentions, but frankly the sheer ability of the United States government and military uh, to handle the complex, cascading, interlocking series of challenges that global climate change and the planetary ecological crisis we face present. Um, statisticians at the University of Washington recently estimated there's a 95% chance the planet will exceed two degrees Celsius warming this century. In a separate paper on population growth and deforestation, two physicists wrote that based on current resource consumption rates and best estimates of technological rate growth, 
we have a very low probability around uh, less than 10% in the most optimistic estimates to survive without facing a catastrophic collapse. Current and historical trajectories for carbon dioxide emissions match uh, worst case scenarios projected by the IPCC, which predict uh, global temperature increases of four degrees Celsius or more by the end of the century. Some models uh, show us reaching four degrees Celsius warming by 2061. Um, it's worth noting that it's impossible to know what life uh, on a planet four degrees Celsius warmer would look like, but such an abrupt change would make adaptation difficult for numerous species, including, of course, Homo sapiens. Um, and as the physicist Joseph, uh, the climatologist Joseph Rahm writes, four degrees Celsius is not the worst case scenario. If we go beyond four degrees Celsius, we move in, in, into an unrecognizable world where we will need a different word entirely than adaptation. Such probabilities and global temperature measurements are fairly abstract representations of what will be experienced locally as a series of abrupt environmental disruptions, all occurring uh, against a general background degradation in the conditions of human life, uh, as Joe Bryan uh, uh, gestured toward. Um, ecologist Christopher Trissos uh, and others write in a recent paper on abrupt ecological disruption, our results show that within 30 years, continued high emissions will drive a sudden shift across many ecological assemblages to climate conditions under which we have almost no knowledge of the ability of their constituent species to survive. The American Southwest, the Amazon Basin, and the Pacific Arctic, uh, Pacific Arctic ecosystems already show signs of profound and long-lasting transformation. In the words of one paper by leading ecologists and biologists, we face a, quote, ghastly future of mass extinction declining health and climate disruption upheavals, including looming massive migrations and resource conflicts this century. Now, although I think of myself as both an anti-militarist and an anti-interventionist, uh, given my experience in Iraq, uh, and have written at length about the calamitous American war in that country, I can't help but admit that even a reasonable anti-militarist position, anti-interventionist position, faces serious challenges when it comes to coping with the emergent turmoil of global climate change. Avoiding troublesome military entanglements in South Asia, South Asia, Central America, and Africa could mean standing idly by while innocents suffer, states collapse, and zones of chaos spread. Repudiating the hubris of American exceptionalism could also mean negligently abjuring any special responsibility for the exceptional wealth and power the United States enjoys. Protecting our men and women in uniform and holding back our military power might be no more than a craven rationalization for refusing to use that power to help those in need. So what should American foreign policy look like in an age defined by cataclysmic ecological rupture? Do our vast national wealth and inherited responsibility for historical carbon emissions lay on us an obligation to the rest of the world? And would we be willing own comfort to help those suffering from our profligacy and neglect? Would US citizens be willing to reduce their own energy use and carbon emissions as Jimmy Carter entreated voters in July 1979, right before he was swept out of office in a landslide for Ronald Reagan? Or is the American way of life not up for negotiation, as George Bush told participants of the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro in 1992? And what about compelling other nations to reduce their emissions? Would we sacrifice American lives to China or India or Russia to decarbonize? Numerous activists and commentators have called for a World War II style national mobilization to fight climate change. And even compared the struggle against climate change to World War III. But the demand for World War II scale mobilization to fight climate change faces numerous problems and would have enormous unforeseen consequences, perhaps even contradicting its original goals, um, as did in many ways America's total mobilization during World War II. Looking at the myriad ways that World War II changed America for better and for worse, including giving birth to the military industrial complex, suggests that it's difficult to know in advance the ramifications of such a sweeping agenda. What's more, my personal experience in Iraq and the evidence of American failure in Iraq and Afghanistan suggests that any such mobilization would stand a good chance of becoming no more than a shambolic fiasco, just another boondoggle for war profiteers. Yet for all this, total mobilization may be our only hope. Ecological collapse is happening all around us. 
We may be nearing or have already crossed the line where it becomes unstoppable. Piecemeal, consensus-driven, incrementalist solutions are tantamount to global suicide. According to a 2018 summary paper the changes need, needed to stabilize Earth's climate require, quote, a fundamental reorientation and restructuring of national and international institutions. <clears throat> Such a program would be another order of magnitude larger and more complex than America's military mobilization during World War II. The problem of climate change is bigger than the New Deal. It's bigger than the Great Depression. It's bigger than World War. The problem of climate change is the problem of how and whether human beings can live together sustainably on this planet. In the words of philosopher Peter Schlotterdijk, it is characteristic of being human that human beings are presented with tasks that are too difficult for them without having the option of avoiding them because of their difficulty. All hell is breaking loose. Any faith we might sustain in the future must be based on a realistic assessment of our situation and a willingness to find practical solutions even if they're dissatisfying, incomplete, or compromised. We either accept this predicament and try to find a way forward, adapting and salvaging what we can, or we doom ourselves to bickering fruitlessly about who gets which deck chair while the world breaks apart under crashing waves of violence and disaster. The 21st century will be defined by climate change. Who we are and how we are remembered will be defined by what we do about it. Eugene? Yep. All right. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I guess I have to kind of talk down to get the mic to work. Um, here, I'll lift my tie because then I can look at you. Um, so that was sobering and um, a big think scale, way beyond what I was anticipating um, uh, talking about myself. So um, I'll try to be, I'll, I'll try to approach that a little bit. So to me, the intersection of international security and climate change, or maybe I shouldn't say international, I should say US national security and climate change um, is uh, different, smaller um, than either Joe Bryan or Roy has uh, talked about. So climate change is a terrible problem, and terrible things are going to happen. They both reviewed some of the horrible effects of ongoing climate change. Like, this is a very serious problem, and we should treat it as such. Absolutely. We should make a big priority effort to address climate change. But um, calling something a security threat or an issue of national security has been, particularly in American politics, but it's also true in other countries, simply a way to say that something is important, right? So what we've done in the past is that we've said national security is important, we'll go to heroic effort, we'll spend lots of money, we'll open the taps, we'll do kinds of policies that we don't tend to do in other areas of policy. We'll accept infringements on individual liberty or other things for national security, but not for other kinds of policy. And so that means that everyone who wants to convince Americans that something is an important policy issue has developed an incentive or understands the incentive to say it's a national security issue. And so they try to link whatever their pet issue is to national security. I think this is a mistake. I think this is, this is a reflection because something else could be important. Climate change is important is a threat to Americans, does change our lives, is worth spending money on, is worth paying attention to, but that doesn't mean that the best way to react to it, or even an important way to react to it, is by using the tools and policies that are available through the Department of Defense or through national security, right? So national security is also an important issue and we as a policy community, or as a set of voters in the United States, a bunch of people who are interested in what the United States does and who we are, could think about setting priorities for our country. And if we realize and recognize that climate change is truly important, 
Well, that should change the emphasis in American policy. We should shift. We should say, well, we'll spend more resources on climate. We'll be willing to take more steps on climate and in compensation because we do live in a world of limited means. There are actually limits, although we're a very rich and powerful country. We can't do everything. That means that, relatively speaking, we should lower the emphasis on other things. And the good news, I was going to try to give a good news talk, unlike my colleagues here. Um, the good news is that the world today is actually safer for the US national interest than in the past. The need to prioritize national security is less. The need to go over there and fight to defend ourselves is less than it was in the past. The, the Soviet Union is gone. That led to the mobilization of trillions of dollars. And the best and the brightest in the United States went into national security for decades. We took people like Roy, who's a great writer, smart guy, thoughtful. And we mobilized them for national security purposes. We said, oh, take a rifle and go fight. And that used up money and intellectual capital and a whole bunch of things that the United States chose at that time. We said our highest priority is this thing, national security. But if we take climate change seriously, the good news is there is no Soviet Union. Maybe there's China. We could talk about whether China is like the Soviet Union or not. It's not in the same ballpark, right? But we don't, if we don't need to mobilize the best and the brightest into the military, we could use the best and the brightest to go work on climate change. The Department of Defense is always, because of the way its organizations work, because of the priorities of people who are in the military, you can tell them a key performance parameter for all of your activities, your programs, your new weapon systems that you're developing, is their energy consumption, is their climate carbon emissions. And they'll factor that into their considerations, but they've already got a list of 10 key performance parameters that have to do with, does this fighter plane fly faster, higher, stealthier, better electronic weapon systems than competitive planes? And they're never giving that up. They'll factor in, but energy consumption is not going to be the highest priority in the national security mission. But it could be the highest priority in other activities of the federal government. It could even be the highest priority for the day-to-day, -day, the quotidian issues, the peacetime issues on American military bases. So you're not going to change the training and how much fuel gets burned up in a high-performance fighter. But you could have a smart thermostat installed in the dorms, such as they're not dorm, barracks, whatever, or in the mess halls, or in the other activities that happen on bases. Like This could just be part of a general government effort to prioritize the environment. But there's no special role for the Department of Defense here. There's nothing that's going to lead the Department. The Department of Defense happens to own a lot of property, happens to have a big budget, happens to convey the word important to Americans. What we should be changing is that last part. We should say, sure, the DOD will do its part, just like the rest of the government will try to have more electric cars on military bases. But we're not going to have an electric F-35 anytime soon. And sure, it turned out when I was in the Pentagon, one of the neat tricks we did was we used biofuel to fly the Blue Angels. We created the Great Green Fleet. So we ran a US carrier battle group on environmentally friendly fuels. You can do that. It was not efficient. It cost a boatload of money. It was a diversion from the primary mission of the Pentagon. It was a trick. That's not what we should be doing. We shouldn't be doing tricks. If we want to focus on climate change, get it. Sure, DOD will do its part, but it's not the lead. We just should have a government climate policy 
that is a practical government climate policy to, to address the scale of the issue. Thanks. I came here today to listen to Diane Deserto, um, not me. Diane is my wonderful colleague. She is one of the leading practitioners, teachers, scholars on international environmental law, on international economic rights, on human rights. And Notre Dame is so blessed to have her here. She inspires me daily. So I'm just going to speak to the points that I know about, that I think she and I agree on, and I apologize that she couldn't be here today. It's tangentially related to the climate crisis. One thing Diane and I definitely have in common is that we incorporate into all of our work Laudate Si. It is an inspirational document that can lead us out of exactly the hopeless cul-de-sac we have worked our way into that we've just heard about from the previous three speakers. I've been teaching international environmental law since 1992. Before that, and right after that, I was a professional military educator for the Department of Defense. A few years later, I married a highly decorated combat veteran of the Gulf War. He was there to see the environmental devastation of military force when Iraq burned the oil wells of Kuwait in their failed retreat after devastating that small country. He suffered from the toxic effects of the weapons we used and the weapons the Iraqi used, much like President Biden's son who contracted cancer after his year of service in Iraq. The, the case for the military's active role in responding to the environmental crisis we face is clear. Eugene might be right in terms of how we pitch it, but I really want to speak more to the role of those of us who are students and scholars, because we helped get us in our country to this point, where the military is focused in a completely wrong direction for the flourishing of the future of all of you and your children. So let me emphasize to begin with that when I started teaching international environmental law, it was the year of the Rio Conference on Environment and Development. The United States signed and ratified the 1992 United Nations Convention on Climate Change. 1992. How many of you were not born in 1992? So this country, oh right, I was born. This country has been committed to active response to the climate problem since 1992. What happened? What happened? The Vice President Al Gore, have you heard of him? So it was President George H.W. Bush who signed and got that treaty through the Senate, two-thirds majority. He did it. And then his Democratic successors, Vice President Al Gore of Inconvenient Truth fame, announced from Kyoto that he wouldn't even put the Kyoto Protocol before the Senate. He and his president, Bill Clinton, didn't want to use their, their credits their political capital to respond to what was already clear to, this, to the, the best and the brightest in this country of what the future existential problem was. No, what did they do? They continued the militaristic policy that we had developed and sunk our treasure into throughout the Cold War. Right, the Soviet Union had disintegrated. It was an opportunity to promote international law, environmental law and protection, human rights, economic justice, but we didn't do that. We started pursuing terrorists with military force. The first, the real beginning of the war on terror was with Bill Clinton bombing Sudan and Afghanistan. In the aftermath of terrorist incidents, not to respond to a true use of military force as allowed under the United Nations Charter, a significant armed attack occurring after the fact to punish and retaliate. And that became military doctrine. So where were we spending our money in this country? Were we spending it on clean fuels, on climate capture technology? We have sunk unfathomable sums into drone technology, into research and development on fully autonomous robotic weapons. 
which the, which the Holy See has said are fundamentally immoral and never usable. But this country is building up a fleet. We already have prototypes of these weapons. But do we have a prototype to save the oceans, to gather the plastic, to do the science to keep fish stocks plentiful? No. We haven't put our money into that. Do you know how much money we have spent on the failed wars in Afghanistan and Iraq? Two trillion dollars each. How much could we have done on the climate problem if we had spent only one trillion dollars? We have not. So one of the things the military can do right now is tell us they don't want that budget that's working its way through Congress right now. If they want to be part of responding to the environmental crisis that we face, just in the, in the past three weeks, Haiti, California, Louisiana, New England, famine in Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Somalia. It's all part of what we should be doing with our money, but we're not. We're building the next generation of drones to carry on the war on terror, even though President Biden promised to end uh, forever wars. So how did we get here? And what's the role for academics and students? I submit to you that the reason Bill Clinton went off that wrong road, followed by the next President Bush, President Obama, President Trump, and so far President Biden, how did we get here? It was a political science ideology during the height of the Cold War that said that the only way a country proves its greatness, retains greatness, and all the privileges that come with that is by projecting military power. After the Second World War, our president then, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who brought us the New Deal and a way out of the poverty of the Depression and the uh, first uh, climate corps that went out to work on agriculture and so forth and the, and the national forests, he had a different message. He said it was law the thing that this country was built on, the rule of law. He gave us the United Nations Charter with the prohibition on the use of military force unless it was an actual self-defense to an actual armed attack. Otherwise, we have diplomacy. We have other measures. We have economic sanctions. We have coercion. We have negotiation. We have all kinds of other ways to respond. But we didn't do that because political scientists told us famous men like Hans Morgenthau, that we had to have the biggest arsenal. That is what gives you the advantage to stay alive. No, not responding to climate change and the fact you can't breathe the air in, in the western states of the US right now. No, having a huge arsenal of nuclear weapons that we will never use. That ideology is so deep. You heard Jean say, in this country, we don't believe something's a problem unless we say it's a national security issue. We call everything a national security issue. Well, let's try to reverse that. We didn't hear from Gene how to reverse that problem. How do we put into people's minds that military defense is the least, it, it, is, it is a real issue, but it doesn't require the kind of offensive spending and thinking that we've been doing. It requires a defensive mode as required by the UN Charter. So how do we, through culture, through new political science ideas, through reviving our commitment to international law, how do we begin to change hearts and minds so that the true conditions of human flourishing are what count and not the projection of military power in realist, militarist, academic thinking? Pope Francis has shown us a way in Laudate Si. He believes in the rule of law. His chapter five in Laudate Si is all about the treaties we need. But how many people, even at Our Lady's University, have one, read Laudate Si, or two, ever even think about international law? A tiny portion of the students in our law school study international law. Let's make it a required course. Let's make it a required course for students of peace studies for students of political science. Let's get those other ideas, the ones Pope Francis cherishes, into the minds of everyone at this university. And then let's pay it forward. Let's 
make it available to every student of literature who wants to write about the beautiful ideas. The, the opening words of the UN Charter are a poem to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war so that we can do other things, so we can promote human rights, economic and environmental justice. We need to reverse that idea that military force is what matters in this country. If Pope Francis has shown us a way, now we have to ask and demand that President Biden step up and shift and be the leader that Franklin Roosevelt was, that Jimmy Carter was, and show us the way to the future that will be possible for all of you. Thank you. Well, I want to uh, thank uh, my, my esteemed panelists a great deal, uh, and uh, I think open it up to, to conversation, uh, questions, comments from the audience. Yes, in the back, Megan. Oh, I will say there, there are mics up here. Oh. Uh, and since, since it's on Zoom, you probably it's, should speak into the microphone. I can repeat the question, I can repeat the question you asked? I'd love to. I teach in here, so I'm going to okay. I can go this direction. Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can, re I can re either repeat your question or you can come up to a mic. Okay, great. All right. I'll make it short. Thank you. Uh, so I'll repeat the question for the, um, for the audience out there, uh, President Mayor, <laughs> Megan Sullivan, asking uh, migration, what the heck, asking, uh, you know, given what we've seen, what we're seeing in Afghanistan, and the, uh, um, you know, you can extrapolate out, um, and the, the expected um, climate change driven migration uh, that we, that we have a very, very high probability of seeing. Uh, some would argue we've already been seeing it, um, which definitely poses an ethical and humanitarian and, and defense uh, department related issue. Uh, how can we develop, or how can we think about this, um, you know, in relation to Laudato Si and these other issues that we're, that we're talking about? I hope it summarized that, yeah, that well I thought enough that and concisely, yeah. but I'll, I'll turn it over. I've, I've got things to say too. Go ahead, Jim. Look, I think, you know, immigration 
I think I turned this on. Yeah, it's on. So immigration to the United States is also an important policy issue. In the United States, we don't primarily handle immigration using the US military. Now, people could debate, right? There's this whole thing. Should we get rid of ICE or not, right? The Department of Homeland Security, is, was it a bad idea to create that department? Um, you know, there's lots of policy issues to discuss with respect to immigration to the United States. It's a pretty, pretty important topic. Um, but to us, it's a different kind of policy. Like, again, the policy tools, how many machine guns do you need to handle? How many tanks do you want? How many fighter aircraft? How many aircraft carriers or submarines? Like, these are the military questions. It's not a military issue for the United States. Now, there's another question overseas. What about migration overseas, right? The world is gonna get worse in a lot of places, and there's predictions that there's going to be a lot of migration. No, you could ask yourself the fundamental question about the role of the US government in addressing those problems. Right? To whom is the US government responsible? Is it responsible to American citizens? Is it responsible to voters in the United States? Like Politicians certainly have an incentive to react to people who can vote, not to people in other countries who can't vote. Right? So this might not be the best mechanism for addressing, it might be individual people's moral commitments, it might be a better mechanism for addressing, rather than US government, and particularly US military action for addressing migration in other countries. If you think about migration, I'm not an international lawyer, I'll leave this to Mary Ellen, and, but the commitment to helping refugees or internally displaced persons who are treated quite differently legally, but morally might be the same, right? There's a commitment to help. You wanna think about, is the military policy tool, or under what circumstances would the military policy tool be the right set of tools, the Department of Defense, to help refugees? Because it is not the core policy tool envisioned in international law by international humanitarian advocates, right? Like, the United States, if we want, could do things to address, in the words of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, our common but differentiated responsibility to reduce the amount of climate change in the world or to help countries adapt to climate change. But that could be through our contributions of science, through our contributions of aid, through our contributions of acceptance of some refugees or helping with resettling, a whole set of things that, again, this is not a national security issue. This might be a national identity issue. Who do we want to be as Americans? But that's a very different question from what you want the military to do. But, Jean, Megan, it is a national security issue for one reason. Our biggest tool through our own misdirection is our military. So, Megan, let's think about it in two time phases. There is the short-term emergency, when we have very few other well-trained, highly disciplined, easily movable organizations than our military. So we have to use them. Over time, we should be adapting that role for the military to something very different for this long-term problem you're talking about. But from day one in the shift, they're scrambling already because we've so suppressed our knowledge of international law, the military is having to handle large numbers of refugees at Ramstein Air Base in Germany, in Qatar at our huge air base there. As they come to the United States, they're going to, right here in Indiana, to a former National Guard base in central southern Indiana. That's, we've got to use our military. But from day one, they should be learning the international legal rules on how to treat um, refugees and migrants and stop treating them in the way that Donald Trump taught when he talked about people coming to this country to migrate as an invading force. That's how deeply we have militarized so much of our thinking. We can, we do have the ability, because we have spent so much money on time, training, resources in our military to stop that way of thinking right away. We're in a poverty of international legal resources because we have so suppressed that as anything we care about in the United States, except for some ersatz, you know, surface references that actually have no depth. But 
the but the institutions of international law still exist outside the US. There is the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. That office should be helping us. We should be funneling money, huge money to that office for their guidance on quick retraining in this short-term emergency and then building out a longer term, more appropriate way that the United States helps with the very problem that we created. Remember, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees has been dealing with the refugee problem since 1948, and, well, from right after the Second World War, but the biggest refugee problem which has remained since 48, 49, the Palestinian crisis. So there is a huge amount of knowledge there. We can do this right if we would finally shift and reprioritize international law in everything that we do. Thank you. I, and I, I would say, uh, oh, formally, I guess, this is, can you, is this on? Yeah? Uh, three, three questions that seem to, um, that speak to this, and I, I want to very much second uh, Mary's point. How do we build a responsive force or um, government capacity for international disaster relief or um, supporting uh, displaced persons uh, or acting in, in those moments of emergency? Um, nationally and internationally? How do we transition from the military doing that job to a uh, civilian government force doing that job? A Peace Corps. A or Peace Corps or a climate force or something like that. Uh, the second question which, which emerges right out of that is, what is our obligation? Right. And, and, and I believe we have one. I believe Absolutely. the privilege and wealth of the United States obligates us to a responsibility to the rest of the world. But what exactly is that responsibility and how do we fulfill that, I think, is a question, the ethical question that um, need, we need to be talking about. Um, and, and then the final question as well that I think emerges is what role does the military play um, in state failure and uh, regional instability right, internationally as these, these things are driven by climate change, as agricultural collapse or drought drives civil war drives migration, drives regional instability, um, as some argued we saw with the Syrian civil war, for instance. Um, that's another key question, I think, that, that we need to emerge and, and be on the table. Bob. So um, I, I didn't come to this session to, uh, to think about the Department of Defense or even the US government's role. When I saw the topic, I'm thinking to myself, we're talking about the Pope's call for Laudato Si, our common home. Um, I'm thinking that you know, the forum this year is gonna be about the, that topic and, and what, and understanding it and so forth. And I was hoping to be illuminated about the international security issues that are gonna come from the climate change and some of the issues that we're dealing with. All of you are knowledgeable about this. You haven't really focused on it. You've touched on it. I would like to, each of you to go through, if you would, and discuss for us, illuminate us, what you see as the challenges to international security, the kinds of things you've already mentioned about refugees and so forth, and how that's going to affect our security issues globally, not necessarily you know, to the United States, not national security, but international security issues. If you just, each of you go through and make a comment about that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah. I used to regularly, Bob, give a, a lecture called Water Wars. Um, I, I, I started doing that in 1999, um, but nobody was interested after 2001. And yet, we have very good in, uh, data that so many of the actual armed conflicts around the world are over, first and foremost, water. The Syrian conflict has roots in the water conflict. Part of the reason we can never seem to solve um, the Palestinian crisis is because Israel controls the headwaters of the Jordan and the aquifer that supplies all the drinking water available in the region, and they don't want to give it up because it's mostly under Palestine, um, uh, under the 1949 borders. The um, crisis in Somalia the ongoing, the current crisis in Ethiopia, these have water 
uh, uh, problems related to them, this is going to go on. I mean, what do you do if your country is running out of water? That, that's a life and death. That, that's much more important than, than Japan's going to war because uh, they didn't have enough oil. If you don't have enough water, your country's done. So uh, we are going to see that kind of conflict. We're going to see less acute conflict, but truly disruptive to countries as they sell their land and their resources to China on the promise that China will build them a dam or in other, way, in other ways try to bring the technology that they need. That's what China is doing throughout the world while the United States sits by and invents new ways of killing people more easily from a distance. So this is the, the future. The US, I think, has a definite international security and ethical role in uh, trying to create a fair playing field where China is not exercising this kind of dominance. One of the ironies is that China is using legal tools of the contract of purchase, of the treaty of understanding, and expecting countries to obey that when they then take undue environmental risks with other countries and take undue profits for their elites. So this is a place, the United States invented the whole concept of, the, of a country under the rule of law. We were the main drafters of the UN Charter. We were the main drafters of so much of the environmental um, treaties. We played a big role in Paris. We need to get back on that and off this uh, mono vision of the future built on this realist view of piling up more weapons. But those are just some of the acute conflicts that are already waging. We can, if we did more research through the Department of Defense, we could forecast where these future conflicts are going to come from. And, we should, and then we could funnel that information to our State Department um, and, and, be doing, and to the United Nations institutions to do much more to do conflict prevention. But we've, we've lost so many of those arts. So look, I, I don't really know where Mary Ellen's animus against realism comes from. It, it, this is a political science debate. The Iraq I don't war, want, the, Iraq but, war the Afghanistan but, war, but, the Vietnam war. But stop, all the prominent realists, academic realists, opposed the Iraq war, opposed the Vietnam war. You cited Hans Morgenthau. Morgenthau's a famous Vietnam war critic. Like, I, I'm happy to answer your question And we can too, debate but, another time. Yeah, yeah so. We'll, we'll do that over canapes. Look, I, 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 I'll be really quick. I got very little to say about this, right? I got lots to say about debates, about empirical political science, about international relations, about whether water wars are a thing or not. We could debate that as much as we want to debate, right? But look, the, the international security, the reason, I just don't think there's much to talk about, about international security and the just transition. The just transition and worrying about climate change is extremely important because it's important. It's the end of the earth, potentially, not through violence, conflict, and coercion, but through getting, making the earth not habitable in a way that we recognize it as habitable. It's not about, like, if you think protecting our common home is important, making this a livable planet is important, that should be enough. I shouldn't have to also explain to you that as the world is less in, you know, inhabitable, maybe some people will fight some wars. There are lots of reasons people fight wars. Maybe there'll be a few more, maybe there'll be a few less. Again, that's empirically debatable. But the main point is that climate change is a problem independent of whether it causes wars or not, right? And we should care about climate change because this is the earth that we've got, and we're wrecking it through mechanisms that have to do with driving our cars every day, or consuming too much you know, uh, um, food, or um, all kinds of other things that have nothing to do with international security. Like, that's, I mean, I just, I, I don't think there is an important argument about international security and climate change. That's the point. 
Yeah, and so I, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the uh, empirical issue. Uh, you know, the, the, the nearest uh, historical example we can find of uh, significant global climate change driving, driving politics and having an effect on, on human international politics is, is the Little Ice Age of the 17th century, uh, which was a period of, of immense uh, political destabilization, uh, mass, you know, pr profoundly devastating wars uh, all across the, the world. And it, it, that was about a degree uh, of cooling. Um, it, you know, locally, it depends regionally how, how exactly the cooling happened. Um, you know, and a lot of this stuff is somewhat difficult to determine. There's a lot of texture to it. Um, but there's, there's no there's no doubt that there are records, for instance, in parts of uh, Eastern and Central Europe that saw a population decrease of 50% uh, in that period, or 30% uh, you know, other places in China, Europe, um, and, and massive warfare and devastation driven by agricultural failure, right? And this is, along with water, uh, water scarcity, and you know, it, millions of people all across the world already face uh, restricted access to water, to clean water, that's go only gonna get worse under climate change. It is going to drive, I'm convinced utterly that it's gonna, it's gonna drive conflict, um, as will agricultural failure, yes. which, which, is, which is going to be um, a massive driver of migration and a massive uh, consequence of, of changing global temperatures and uh, growth patterns for all kinds of crops all over the world. Um, and so this is what, what I'm concerned about is. So it doesn't bother you if those people just starve to death, but if to avoid starving to death, they start a war, now you get upset about it? Like, right. I, don't, I don't understand. It bothers me if they starve to death. I agree that climate change is a problem absent, as, aside from the, the international security implications. I think the international security implications are, are also disturbing. I think they're both disturbing, whether they starve to death or whether they, invade their neighbors and kill them and take their food. I think those are both disturbing, and I think those are both likely consequences of climate change. Yes, of the original. We'll have, um, we have one, more. one more question. We've got a reception across the hall, but uh, first. Um, hi, um, thank you to the panelists for the thought-provoking uh, discussion. Um, I would have liked to you know, echo the, the, you know, <laughs> the sentiments that have already been expressed, and that is, this discussion sounded more of a U.S. defense, you know, discussion. Uh, coming into here, I was also expecting to hear a lot about, you know, the relationship between climate change, you know, and international security, if any. And of course, I think, because I think in a certain way, I would have, so I don't really have a question or, or you know, I have like a question or a comment. Um, and that is, I think I would have preferred the starting basis to be is international, sorry, is climate change an international uh, security crisis in the first place? Because coming in here, and of course listening to the sp first speaker, centering everything around the US, as though the US is exempt from the consequences of climate change, as though the US is the messiah of everything in the world, talking about Africa and the starvation in Africa, as though we're just hungry in Africa because we are hungry with climate change, whereas part of hunger in Africa comes with you know having to export and send things off to you and that's why we're partly hungry because we can't even afford the same food that we grow you know and harvest so i think coming into here i was expecting or if the if the speakers can go into is it really you know uh, an international security problem and whether the u.s is exempt from its consequences and its role as a state is limited to going outside of its you know borders and playing the messiah Thank you. Um, you oh, well, let's go in reverse order. Okay, we'll go in reverse order. Right. So uh, I, I would say uh, climate change uh, had, is not yet an international security crisis, although it has generated um, uh, regional security crises. Um, and, uh, but it, I, I am highly confident that as we see increasing, uh, you know, increasing water scarcity, increasing agricultural failure, um, and increasing sea level rise and uh, displacement of, 
of people in coastal cities and increasing migration, climate-driven migration over the course of the century, um, it is going to be an international security crisis uh, because when, when you have these kinds of mass migrations, uh, it creates, um, you know, it, it drives destabilization, state failure, uh, and security issues all over the world. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I do think it is. And this is the question. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm an anti, I, I, I consider myself an anti-interventionist, and I don't think the, the United States should, the, the United States is going to be impacted, and I don't think it, it should be acting as, you know, the global savior running around saving everybody. Yet, I also think that the tremendous wealth of, of the United States and its political, the political hegemony it's secured, and, and its history of contributions to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere all create some kind of moral obligation to reach out and to help care for our common home, to help care, to help work toward um, you know, a just transition to a sustainable future globally. And if sometimes you know, that means assisting in peacekeeping, or sometimes that means um, you know, working to, to deliver grain, I think that's all, all part of a piece, all part of the same obligation. Eugene? Well, I mean, so you know the answer. I, I think the answer is no. This doesn't have anything to do with international security. It's just important. Um, but, um, and look, I don't want to go into those kinds of debates, but the, the, the U.S. as the Messiah question, I would say something about, which is, People all around the world, people in African countries, people in Latin America, whatever, they didn't elect the US leaders. They have no voice in US policy, right? They, they, the, they're not crying out for the US to come to their countries and fix their problems, or to fix their problems with the US military in particular, right, as an international security issue. But they're, they, you know, the giving agency to people around the world maybe offering them help, offering, you know, saying, look, we're investing in technology to address these problems. We're, you know, gonna be willing to give you funding. We're gonna be willing to give you aid to have a better electric grid or whatever it might be. Those all seem reasonable, but no one made the United States the government, made the US government, the global solution to the just transition or to the climate problem. It wouldn't be a just transition, actually, if the United States went around the world and imposed our vision of the transition on other countries. If we say, we're sick of you, Bolsonaro, burning down the rainforest in Brazil, so we're gonna come conquer Brazil and stop it, that might be good for climate policy if it worked, but it is not just, right? It's up to the people of Brazil to decide whether they wanna burn down the rainforest and I think we should help them realize that that's a bad idea. And that would be, you know, the U.S. doesn't, I mean, the U.S. has moral obligations. People of the United States have certain obligations in the world, I believe, I hope they will believe it too. But that doesn't make, you know, if you want to think about the policy response to that, you know, what can we do? Well, we can vote. And we can vote for US leadership, but we can't vote for leadership of Brazil, and Brazilians can't vote for leadership of the United States. We have to recognize the set of tools that we have, and what we do as an individual, and what we do as a government. Thanks. This is the reason why Diane Deserto should be sitting here and not me. She is from the Philippines. She brings that international perspective. So I apologize again. I'm an American. And I have felt very deeply in my entire life, even though most of my education and many years were spent outside this country, including in Africa. But my um, sense of obligation and duty is to teach from the American perspective how much we need to change in this country and be a partner around the world for change. Laudate Si is where I start. And I did emphasize that in my remarks. The Pope speaks so eloquently of care for our common home, of looking at our common bond of law, the thing we've crafted together, the international rule of law. It's the only thing we have in common. 
It's above religion, it's in terms of commonality. It's above language, it's above borders. It is the thing we all have, and it is the unique tool that can bring us to a better place on every challenge internationally you could speak to. That said, I, th I think that very uh, understanding, which is so beautifully, you know, Pope Francis used the term beauty 23 times in Laudate Si, and he understands the beauty of law. He understands what St. Thomas Aquinas referred to as tranquility and order. And that's what he speaks to, and, we can, and, and the United States has both a positive duty and a negative duty, a negatively based duty to step up and to play a leading role with our partners, to become one of many. Um, and, and that is because for, for simple reasons of legal liability, Americans contribute per capita more greenhouse gases than any other country in the world. And we've been doing it for a long time. We've also had the knowledge. We have been doing climate science. We have been doing science that shows what greenhouse gases with carbon dioxide does to the atmosphere since the 1950s. That's been in our knowledge banks. And we haven't been pushing it out. But we also have this great experiment of human society under law and not under a human individual sovereign. We're losing that around the world as oppressive individuals take over. Because the United States has been so distracted with this mono vision of what is national security, written narrowly, that, and we see it in these, it's, it's only in these narrow, violent um, uses of, of force like terrorism. My wonderful friend and colleague, John Mueller, the political scientist at, at Ohio State, has written a new book called The Stupidity of War. Because that is not the existential threat. That is not the real threat. Neither terrorism, nor the migrant invasion, nor any of these things that we've been characterizing as national security threats. It is this other thing. And we can, the, the resources, the talent, the privilege in this country, that all of you who have come here to be with us, that I brought back from abroad to further enrich this country, we've got to make the change here. We can follow Pope Francis for the road, but I want to challenge all of you, and I wish all of you who have ideas on this to write to me, because I, as I mentioned at the start, I've been doing this a long time, but I can't even convince my friend Jean here <laughs> that we have to think in, we have to think about security in very different terms, in nonviolent terms, in defensive terms, and in creative ways to securing truly what that word means, environmental, human security. How can we get the Pope's thinking first and foremost, and, and, and not these mantras of war? Not these mantras of, you know, as our friend John Mearsheimer would say, we just need a little war with China. That's, that's the kind of thinking that an eminent University of Chicago realist speaks to. Okay. Sure. Uh-oh. I'm John, sorry. John, that's my fault. I should have opened that door. John would not right. say, let's have a <laughs> war. <laughs> uh, well, I want to, um, I would love to keep the conversation going. Clearly, we have much more to talk about, but we need to go across the hall and do it over uh, wine and uh, little treats. Uh, for those of you in the Notre Dame community, um, please, please join us uh, across the hall for the reception and continue the conversation. Um, for those of you not in the Notre Dame community, again, we're sorry that you, we can't um, uh, have you participate in that part, but thank you for coming. Um, I want to thank um, my, my esteemed panelists for their, their incredible contributions, especially uh, Mary Ellen O'Connell for stepping in at the last minute um, with, you know, this incredible, yeah, thank you. Um, but also Eugene, thank you so much. And, and also uh, Joe, uh, Joe Bryan, thank you um, for, for being with us in spirit and for, for helping set the stage, right, for the Notre Dame Forum for the year, right, uh, just transition to a sustainable future, which I hope we'll all continue talking about and working toward. Uh, throughout, throughout the coming academic year. And also, uh, a special thanks 
um, uh, to Deb Javelin, Deborah Javelin um, from, from political science who introduced and, and also set the stage for us up here. Um, so thank her and uh, everyone else who made this happen. And thank you all for your great questions and for coming to be with us for this discussion here today. Thank you. Yeah.